Hello, welcome back again to the Fabric Espresso series about data engineering and data science using Microsoft Fabric. My name is Estera, and today I have for the third time special guest, Daniel. Thank you for having me once more. Last time, Daniel was sharing the insights about load to tables feature in Microsoft Fabric. And before that, he was sharing all the truth about shortcuts and external tables. So if you miss those episodes, please watch, check our channel and uh, watch them. So today, a new topic, again, from the area of Spark data engineering patterns. Uh, we uh, named the topic optimizing Delta tables for Power BI users. Could you please explain, especially for those who are just entering the space, the concept of Delta tables and how it's related to parquet format or maybe other data formats? Sure. So a Delta Lake uh, table is a, what we call as a table format. It's a open source, scalable standard. Okay, uh, As we discussed previously, on, I think on the episode number one, on data lakes, the connection between the data itself on disk and the metadata definition that teaches how the engines should access that data is disconnected, unlike database, uh, traditional databases, database software. So a Delta Lake table is a, a format that brings features to this opaque disk structure. I'm going to talk about what those features are in a little bit more detail. But what it brings is, is tabular, table-like structure and behavior to a messy location of files. Uh, many people consider this to be like the foundation for lake house architectures. Without a table format, you're just at a data lake state. So it's very hard to organize a, a data lake into a lake house if you don't have like a, a strong opinionated table format on top. So uh, you, you asked me about how it relates to Parquet. So Delta uses Parquet as the storage format by default. Other table formats, not Delta, use different uh, file types. Some, some use Parquet, some use Orc, some use other things, uh, but Delta uses Parquet, which is a, a very good approach because Parquet is one of the most efficient uh, columnar file types out there uh, today. We could have used like RC, Orc, Avro, anything else, but Parquet it is. So uh, just as a final for that question, it's like, but what uh, does Delta actually do because the storage is parquet, so I think things are solved, right? Wrong. So Delta brings uh, ACID transactions uh, into the data lake universe. That was one of the hardest things to approach on the old Hadoop era, uh, and that Delta Lake so solves beautifully by you know, creating the structure on top of the parquet files. It provides better data ma metadata management, provides column mappings, uh, provides ordering abstractions for performance. It has a ton of features on top of the Parquet file, uh, you know, that users require to manage structured data uh, for uh, in organizations. I think a, a final piece there, it with okay, I have Parquet and I have this structure on top of Parquet. One big thing that it delivers is performance by the like as a standard, a delta table query out, outperforms a regular parquet table query 10 to 11, uh, 100 fold. So just by providing this structure on top, it's able to really understand what's going on, not on an individual parquet file level, but across all the files. So the engines that use Delta can really tap into more performance. Wow, that, that really makes sense. And uh, now I'm wondering, what is the order? Okay, so the order is, is a right time optimization that we do on the parquet files uh, of a Delta table. So forget a little bit about Delta, but so when we are writing to a Delta table, we end up writing to the parquet file. So it, the way it works is that we apply a special sorting a different row group distribution, 
some specific dictionary encoding. So they're all complex terms, but in, in some, and that kind of ends up giving a little bit more compression because it's specially ordered in a way that compresses a little bit better. What it gives at the end, it, it requires, you pay a penalty on the right. So it, it requires a little bit more compute on the right, but on the, it, the benefits on the read side is that you get a better compressed file. So you read less data from disk. So net, last network, last disk, and, and on the read side, last CPU uh, resources uh, for all the engines to read it. So it, it does provide like cost efficiency and performance on the read path. If you consider that on a lake house, you're gonna write once and read many. So that, that additional performance on the right pays itself, you know, a hundred or thousands of times uh, as you move forward, right? So what it does in Microsoft Fabric is that enables uh, like lightning fast reads uh, on the other Microsoft Fabric compute engines, especially Power BI. Um, but SQL, Spark, and others, they all be benefit from it. What things, uh, one special question that people ask around uh, V order is that, oh, is that a proprietary uh, Microsoft thing? Are we blocking other engines uh, from reading it? Not at all. Okay, Microsoft engines are the only, uh, Microsoft Fabric engines are the only ones that can write uh, a very parquet, but it is still a standard 100% open source parquet file. So you can actually write with us, you can read with others, no problems, and you're going to collect the benefits of reading a more compressed and better organized file. So that's, that's what it is. So it sounds that if I'm using like different clouds, different services, or if I'm using Azure Databricks, there is no issue. We can leverage the best of the order and get the optimization because it's like, it's, it sounds like performance optimization at the end for the end user. Yes. Super. Is it enabled by default or oh, yeah. I have to do something? No. So across Microsoft Fabric, the order is enabled by default on all workloads. So when you're ingesting data using data pipelines or you know, Spark or something else, or even load to tables, everything just gets reordered by default. It is, it is right there. It is, it's there for us. So in our docs, uh, you, you will find like exactly how to, if you need to enable it differently so, so, or disable it. Uh, but it also, it also teaches how to convert a table that you might be bringing into the Fabric universe by shortcuts or something, how to convert those tables into the order, like how to apply. It's not convert tables to the order. It's like how to apply the ordering to, a, a, to an existing Delta table. This is very, very sp uh, important for uh, external integration scenarios, right? Imagine that you have an external Delta generated table being generated somewhere. You brought that table in with external shortcuts. Yeah, that table is not of the order by default, but you can use, you know, scheduled jobs or uh, some features that we have in Microsoft Fabric to slowly convert your partitions to the order and, and provide better integration for everyone. So you're going to take in the benefits of that approach inside Fabric and outside of Fabric, right? Because now we're converting table to the order elsewhere as well. I'm just wondering, are there any cases, some benchmarks that you can share when the order created significant difference in terms of performance? It's actually the other way around uh, as we look at Fabric. Uh, if a customer turns it off uh, and just points a Power BI report to a legacy Delta table that, you know, that doesn't have the order, performance degrades significantly. Um, that's, that's why we made it on by default as well. Uh, it serves a great purpose in Microsoft Fabric. And at the same time, it doesn't hurt anything else. Like the, the right performance impact is not that great when you consider that you're going to be querying much more than you're writing. Um, so getting data ready to analytics by default, by applying the order was a principle that we use when designing Microsoft Fabric and we enabled it by default. In this demo, we will show the V-Order capabilities in Microsoft Fabric. 
we will work with this data set, it's a sizable data set, and create two different tables, one with the order on, one with the order off, and we're going to check the differences. First, notice that the order is on by default in your Spark session. Now, let's load the data frame into memory. Now let's disable the ordering and create a delta table from the in-memory data. The table will be named yellow trip data no v order. Now let's write the same data but with the order enabled. First, enable the order, back again, and start the table right. The table will be named yellow trip data. Now both tables are loaded. Let's count the rows and see how it goes. Now that we know that the row count is the same, let's take a look at the files. For the no v order table first. So this roughly adds up to 4 gigabytes of data. Now let's take a look at the v order one. Wow, that adds up to roughly 1.4 gigabytes of data. So huge savings in storage cost. But this is not about parquet file compression as both writes use the same snappy compression algorithm. What the order does is better row group strategy and, and, and dictionary encoding that itself drives the file size down. The parquet files are still 100% standard parquet and you can read it with any standard parquet reader outside of Fabric. Where the order really shines is when you start kind of querying it with using Power BI or the T-SQL endpoint. Let's quickly take a look and create a new Power BI dataset out of this yellow trip data v order table. With the dataset at hand, we're not going to do major modifications. Just take, check the schema. It's counting over most columns. That's fine. So let's just create a report out of it. Let's drag vendor name. Remember that this table has 1.6 billion rows. And now let's just sum the total amount. There you go. Let's change it to a column chart. And you're ready to do analytics. So the feature sounds amazing. I'm just wondering if there are any scenarios that we may anticipate that we should disable it? Yes. So when you're forming a lake house or any data lake uh, whatsoever, um, that won't be serving Power BI right away, right? There are a lot of scenarios where you're forming a bronze layer. They are pretty much very data engineering centric. People who will be using it are data engineers who are kind of plumbing everything together. Uh, Data is kind of, you're plumbing things from AWS and you have a bunch of ingestions and streaming pipelines. It's more performance critical to write and that data is not going to be served right away. So turning it off might, might fit, fit better because you don't pay for uh, an additional uh, you know, overhead when you're writing. That they won't be served anyway. It's going to fly into a silver or a gold tier before it gets ready um, uh, for serving. So that's one scenario that we have been tracking with customers that, okay, on this scenario, on like an ingestion of a streaming scenario that writes too many small files uh, that you can't control, that data is not going to be served right away, just write it as you were writing it before. And then you use um, 
incremental steps to get the data of the order as you move uh, the tables across the medallion architecture, right? Is uh, it the only case? So a final, I think a final one is like where your, your the data is, the Delta table is already created externally. I think we mentioned that before. And, you know, it doesn't have the order, right? Uh, so you can establish a scheduled job to incrementally bring your partitions over to the order as you're getting ready to serve it. I think the main concept is if you're generating tables that are not designed to be served right away, you can consider not enabling the order and then you enable it as you move forward and get closer to the serving layer uh, of your architecture. Super. Yeah. Thank you so much. I learned a lot. I believe that people who are watching us as well, thank you for the third time being here and see you on the next episode that we will discover more and more on the data engineering and data science in Microsoft Fabric. Thank you so much.